reiterate something that uh, Brian Fitzgerald said, and um, that is, if you would like to participate directly in really impacting lives for the God's kingdom, um, you can just let us know today if you'd like to contribute toward this additional need in Uganda. And um, Joel will be leaving here, I guess, on Tuesday midday or whatever. Not that we have to send him on his way with a check, but at the same time, if you do feel like the Lord is prompting you to give something toward this most recent project, um, write a check today, designate it for um, Uganda, and we'll make sure it goes where you feel like the Lord is leading you to, to give it to. So. Appreciate, Jeff, what you shared. That was a good, good, timely word, wherever you are. So in this uh, final message on this series that I've been sharing, uh, I'd like to summarize a little bit of what we've been saying about human depravity, a wonderful, edifying topic, and uh, God's grace, a truly edifying topic, and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Pray with me, if you will. Father, in this time that we have, I pray that this would not just be a quote-unquote sermon that we sit through and are conscious of time and uh, ready to move on to other things, but let this be your word quickened by your spirit that will capture our hearts at a deeper level with a, uh, a greater vision of your kingdom and what you want to do in us and through us. So uh, quicken this by your Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I uh, appreciate the song that we sang this morning. And there was an emphasis on these two verses I've been sharing. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. And so we've considered in past messages that our justification in Christ frees us not only from our condemnation as sinners before God, but also from our ongoing bondage to the law of sin and of death. That is, our salvation would be woefully incomplete if we were set free merely from the consequences of our sin without at the same time being set free from the cause of those consequences, which is law of sin and of death itself. And so we saw this correlation between our legal justification before God God, and at the same time, our liberation, actual liberation from the power of sin with Paul's words to the Galatians. It's a really neat two verses here. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That is, we're justified before God and forgiven from the consequences of our sin. And at the same time, we're given the Holy Spirit, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Think of, in this case, the law as a dynamic power. In this case, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that empowers us to be liberated from our condition of human depravity. And we saw this prophesied in Ezekiel. We looked at this a couple weeks ago where speaking through uh, Ezekiel, God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. We sang about this this morning, this justification, this cleansing uh, by God of us for our justification. But he says, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause or inspire you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So again, God promises not only to forgive us and justify us, but also to restore us into a relationship with himself we are where we are enabled by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus so Paul emphasizes this promise of the spirit through faith 
So there really is no Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit. And God wants to take us beyond understanding this as mere doctrine. He wants us to understand this as reality and practice in our lives. He wants us to experience this in a deeply intimate, personal actual basis and um, it's just interesting in Galatians I, I really was struck by the scripture Galatians 3 he's addressing the Galatian believers and he says having begun by the spirit Christianity begins by and with the spirit that is the Christian life is initiated by his interaction with us but our interaction with the Holy Spirit not as a doctrine, but as a person. You know, the third person of the Godhood, God, the Holy Spirit. And so, um, you know, the whole thing starts because uh, it's the Spirit who gives life. And this is not a legal thing or a religious thing. This is a relational thing. The reality of God's Spirit giving us the very life of God. So uh, the Holy Spirit breathing God's life into our human spirit. And then we continue walking in this principle that Paul defines as the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So there's no authentic Christian life apart from this Spirit-inspired, Spirit-filled, Spirit-enabled reality of the Holy Spirit taking out the heart of stone, the old depraved human nature, and replacing it with a heart of flesh, the organic reality of relationship with Him. Let me uh, quote these words that I quoted last week from John Stott. If we do not have Christ's Spirit in us, we do not belong to Christ at all. This makes it plain that the gift of the Spirit is an initial and universal blessing received when we first repent and believe in Jesus. Of course, there may be many further and richer experiences of the Spirit and many fresh anointings of the Spirit for special tasks. But the personal indwelling of the Spirit is every believer's privilege from the beginning. I think this is an important thing for us to understand. So Paul emphasizes the implications of our receiving and being filled with and motivated by the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5. And I'm just going to pick up there in Galatians 5 and kind of follow it to the end of the chapter, start in the middle of the chapter. I, I don't have time for the whole, we don't have time for the whole chapter this morning. But he says, for you were called to freedom. Remember Romans 8, 2, the law of the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit has set us free free from the law of sin and of death. And he says here in Galatians 5, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This emphasis on freedom is consistent with those words I just quoted from Romans 8 about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And Paul is not speaking here of a, of a, a liberation from bondage, from sin, into a completely autonomous freedom where we're just totally disconnected from anything in our autonomous freedom. Rather, our freedom is being transferred from our bondage to the law of sin and death into submission to another law, a greater law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So this autonomous freedom is what Satan tempted Eve and Adam with in the first place. You can be free. You can be your own God. You can do your own thing. You can call the shots as you think are best. Because who's better placed to figure out what's in your best interest than you yourselves? And yet that proved to be the greatest bondage that freedom ended up being utter human bondage because we weren't created to be that way as, as the creature. So that's the, the freedom that we're set free from is that bondage to our freedom. And I'm glad that I'm no longer free, but I'm glad I'm under now the law of the spirit of life 
in Christ Jesus. That's where we need to be in our proper place as a creature. I appreciate what he says here when he talks about um, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What has this got to do with the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? Well, this concept of love is the complete opposite of my self-centeredness, my old human depravity. Love is all about loving the other for the sake of the other and not what I can get out of it for myself. Now, when I love that way, I get a lot of benefit personally from that. That's, that's true, isn't it? When we love selflessly. But human love, the love that flows out of our old self-centeredness, even if it's at a subconscious level, it's like, what can I get in return? And that's part of what the scripture is saying here. We're set free from that self-centered concept of love where we're loving for what we can get out of it. So, um, you know, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. I think in Uganda, it just strikes me, uh, who else is caring for orphans there? And why are they doing that? And what a tremendous testimony that has to be to the larger nation of Uganda to see these guys uh, picking up these orphans and caring for them. And um, fulfillment of this new commandment that Jesus Christ has given to us. And Paul says in Galatians, uh, with such love there is no law. Um, and um, it's the fulfillment of the law, loving your neighbor as yourself. So what's this got to do with the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? Um, Paul expands this concept in verse 16. He says, but I say, walk by the spirit, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So, if we're living by reliance upon the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, we will not carry out our old nature's self-centered fleshly desires. And this is what Paul emphasizes back in Romans 8. We looked at the scripture previously. As many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons and daughters of God. And what does the Holy Spirit lead us to do? Paul says, if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That is... If we've truly been set free from the law of sin and of death and are now living according to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, we will be led by the spirit to put to death the deeds and attitudes of the old, depraved, self-centered nature. It's so easy for us to say, God told me this. God showed me to do that or whatever. And then to go out and just, you know, live the old lifestyle. But the true mark of the Spirit-filled life, the starting point, is the Spirit leads us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Because we've been set free from the law of sin and of death. And so this, this is going to be the hallmark of the Christian life. Not moral perfection, but an attitude that is cooperating with the Spirit who's leading us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Because the deeds of the flesh lead to death, ultimately. Paul says, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. In this case, by law, Paul means the Old Testament moral code that exposes human depravity and condemns us because of our inability to perfectly live up to its standard. But in contrast, when we come under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, 
we're not under the bondage of living up to a, some kind of technical legal standard, but we're liberated to live in the spirit in terms of our attitudes and mindset. We're not constantly looking over our shoulder out of fear that maybe we have fallen short because none of us can live up to the law. But when we're being led by the Spirit, even if we're not perfect, which we aren't and won't be, we can embrace the justification. There is therefore now no condemnation. But we can also be at liberty and freedom to walk by the Spirit. I, this, I don't know, just since I started study on this particular topic, you know, I, I try to memorize a greater passage, but I can't get beyond verse 2, as you probably have noticed. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. And so every time I turn around, every time I'm thinking about a situation or I'm tempted to be angry about something or be impatient with somebody or, or whatever, I think to myself, wait a minute, I'm not under bondage to that anymore. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and of death. And as that becomes more and more of our mindset, it becomes actualized in our lives as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. I, uh, I'm kind of blowing through my notes here, but I, I appreciate what we sang this morning. And I was reminded about this whole thing of justification. Jeff, Jeff said, we don't have to, again, look behind us uh, at, at all of our failures. Um, one statement I read uh, this past week from Thomas Torrance says, the resurrection tells us that when not a God, but when God declares a man just, that man is just. Do you ever struggle with condemnation? Anybody in here when you fail? I mean, of course you do. We all do. But how absolute is God? How absolute is He? Mostly absolute? Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolute. So if God has absolutely justified us, how justified are we? Absolutely. Even when we fail, are we slow learners to that point? Most of us are. When we fail even, we're still justified and we can run to the throne of grace and receive grace and find mercy to help in time of need. So um, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be our foe if God is on our side? Because God is absolute and He's on our side. God is, as we sang this morning, good. Absolutely good. Who is there to condemn us? Well, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, who died, or rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, actually pleading as He intercedes for us. Is He going to condemn us? No, and if He doesn't condemn us, is there anybody else qualified to condemn us successfully and convict us? No. Not before God's throne. So we, we have that important aspect of our salvation. Our justification with God is absolute because God has absolutely accomplished it. But then He also has given us Himself. And Paul calls it the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That almost sounds impersonal. What he's given us is the Holy Spirit himself. The power of the Holy Spirit to set us free then from having to continue under bondage to that law of sin and of death. Paul um, goes on to contrast this reality with our old depravity. He says in verse 19 of Galatians 5, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Let's go back there. Carousing, we could say period. Anybody, don't raise your hand, guilty at any time? But he doesn't stop there. He said, things like these. You mean there's more? <laughs> Stuff like that? Yeah, there is. Flowing out of our old human depravity. And he says, I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice 
such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Why, why do you think he says this? Well, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and of death and these things. We're no longer under that bondage. So if our salvation is real and we've been set free from that power, then we can walk in that reality. Okay? When we understand that He's given us His Holy Spirit to allow us to walk in that reality, setting us free from things like these. And so this is the context for a statement I made last week. We would surely pursue holiness with greater eagerness if we were convinced that it is a way of life and peace. I do not mean holiness in a, as a kind of moral perfectionism, as a kind of legal, I've got my act together and I have pretty much put sin behind me and I've got this thing nailed now because that's spiritual pride for one thing. But we've already defined holiness as, a, as a, a very humble attitude that says, apart from Him, I can do nothing. If I'm not connected to Him in a vital, organic relationship, you know, I, I can't live up to any standard. I can't be perfect or anything close to it. So holiness is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that is seeking to walk in this other thing called the fruit of the Spirit rather than the old deeds of the flesh. So he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is the Spirit of life, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And it's characterized by these qualities. This is not moral perfectionism. This is a, a, a spirit. This is an attitude. We might call it, this is the spirit of the law by which we are called to live and enabled to live. I, I think to myself when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. I increasingly understand that this is what Paul is talking about. The reality of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives here on earth, even as it is in heaven. In verses 24 and 25, um, as we get toward the end of the chapter, Galatians 5, Paul says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its self-centered, selfish passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. I remember as a young Christian sitting around the table at the Knopf's house and Papa, Knopf, and I would talk a lot about Romans 6, 7, and 8 in these passages in Galatians. And he'd talk about how in Christ our flesh has been crucified with Christ and um, been put to death. And I would shake my head yes and go, that's fantastic. And I would be really encouraged. And then I would walk out in face of the reality that my old nature, if it was crucified in Christ, it sure was kicking pretty hard throughout the week. Anybody experience that? So why is that? Is maybe, did Paul kind of get it wrong here? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified with the flesh? So did it just not take with me? I used to think other Christians probably didn't struggle like I did with the old flesh, with the old nature. And then I found out that that was not the case at all. And I think the Old Testament helps illustrate the answer to this question. Why is it that I still have to do battle against my old nature? that I have to reckon myself dead to my old nature, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And I think uh, one, one thing that occurs to me uh, as we look at the Old Testament, when God led the Hebrew people out of their bondage in Egypt, and he pointed them to the promised land, and he says, here, this land is promised to you. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, great blessing, abundance, wealth, etc. Go in, possess it, it's yours. But the Hebrew people didn't just stroll into the land and set up housekeeping. They had to do great battle to possess the land. I wonder why that was. 
Um, well, I think that one of the reasons is that God wants us to uh, grow in our faith and what it is to trust Him and to cooperate with Him. One of the uh, things that Jesus said, the same thing He said in common to all seven churches uh, in Revelations 2 and 3 is to each church, He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. The Hebrew children didn't just walk into the promised land. They had to overcome. They had to base their lives consistent with God's promises by faith. And they had to take possession of the land in obedience by faith. Even though the land had been promised to them, they had to possess it by faith. I think the same thing is true for us as believers. The old flesh has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ liveth within me. But by faith, I've got to overcome the world. I've got to overcome the flesh. James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. There's something that takes place as we learn to overcome by faith. In this case, it's a character quality, endurance, but it's not just that. It's other qualities as well that God builds into our lives as we learn to overcome trials and challenges to our faith. Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, in my case it's been quite necessary, you have been distressed by various trials at the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you think it's good that faith is tried in the refiner's fire, that it might be proven and purified? I think this is a large part of the answer to the question, if we've been crucified with Christ, why is it we still have to struggle with the old flesh? It's so that we might learn to be overcomers. Even Jesus, the author of Hebrews, writes, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. I've always had a hard time understanding that. Why, if Jesus was God the Son, did he have to learn obedience from the things which he suffered? But we also believe that Jesus was very man of very man. He experienced everything as a human being that we experience. The same temptations, the same trials, etc. And when it says he learned obedience, I think another way to say that is his obedience was proven through the fiery trials that he faced. And so I think, again, this is a large part of the answer to our question. God wants us to become overcomers, not by just simply strolling into the promised land and setting up housekeeping, but learning how to do spiritual battle and to possess it against all the enemies that come against us in our faith. There's an interesting scripture in Romans 8 that I, I didn't talk about, but it's related to this where Paul says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if we indeed suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is not just suffering at the hands of persecutors or people who are you know, discriminating against Christians, discriminating against Christians or that type of thing, it's the opposition that we experience as believers following Jesus Christ who are in this world but not of this world because the mainstream of the world is going this away and if we're following Jesus we're going that away. That opposition can be likened to a significant degree, I think, in this context 
to suffering. And I think this is what, in large part, Paul is talking about. That is, to be typical of our experience if we're really going to follow Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. John says, For whatever is born of God by His Spirit overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. God in His wisdom and mercy has left us in this world in order to help us to become overcomers and to purify and refine our faith. So he says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit, because this is what the Spirit leads us to do. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which has set us free from the law of sin and of death. And in Revelation we read, And he said to me, It is done, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost, he who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. We overcome by faith, by walking in the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. His Spirit in us, enabling us to walk in that victory that overcomes the world. This is not a doctrine primarily. This is not um, some intellectual concept. This is the core reality of our Christian faith. And God just wants us to better understand this and He wants to take us deeper in this reality as we move forward in the days ahead. Pray with me, please. Father, our salvation is so much greater than anything we have yet imagined, and it's so much more practical to our everyday lives here and now than many of us have realized. Please, Lord, simply continue to open our eyes to see the preciousness of what we have in the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Deliver us, Lord, from indifference and lukewarmness. Give us a deeper passion to pursue this beauty of your holiness. Help us to see that your holiness is beautiful. It's not a legal thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's the spirit of life and peace, eternal abundance, the fruit of the spirit, just dripping with holiness. May we see holiness in that light. Father, we thank you that this holiness is not moral perfectionism. But it's a heart that is humble, that runs to your throne to receive mercy and grace continually, and which wants to burrow down deeper into what it means to abide into Christ in an ongoing communion and fellowship with Him. So none of these things are possible for us, Lord, apart from your grace and the enabling power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we acknowledge that we're never even close to being saved by our human works, but by your Spirit, you do enable us to be drawn into your holiness and its expression in our lives. So again, Lord, capture our hearts more fully with this vision that truly the things of this world will grow dimmer in our affections as our vision for you and the beauty of your holiness grows deeper. Lord, in what we've shared in these messages, will you accomplish these things in us beyond all that we can think or imagine by the power of your Holy Spirit that dwells within us? And we just pray this simply in the name of Jesus Christ. Do, Lord, what only you can do in us, we pray. Amen. I somewhat rushed through that, but hopefully you got the gist, and it's not so much me anyhow, it's what the Holy Spirit maybe has deposited in your heart through uh, what we shared this morning through His Word. So copies of the message on either side, and we are dismissed in the name of the Lord. Amen.